Hey, just a couple quick, uh, couple quick announcements before we get started. Um, as most of you have seen, there's some boards over there that do have the information if you want to take a look at them at some point. There is a sign-in sheet on that table back there. If you want to get a chance, you can sign in. Uh, you don't have to do it right now. We can try to move, maybe circulate it around or on your way out. And uh, the final thing would be after the meeting, if anyone wants to, we'd be more than willing to show you any places in the building if you want to go through any classrooms or, or look at anything um, in case you have uh, any questions about you know if we talk about rooms that you can't get to without walking through another room if you don't know what that looks like we can let you experience that so um, so I think that's about all I have are we ready to are we ready to get going are you kicking this off or they we can hand it to Kick it off. All right. So we'll have our, uh, our designer, Lamro Pagano Associates. Um, I'll have uh, Eric Moore start us. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for having us here tonight. Thank you for coming out in this beautiful weather. Um, our team here is Peter Caruso, Sean Brennan, um, Trip, Trip Elmore, and I'm, I'm Eric Moore. And not here tonight, but someone who did a lot of work up front with us is Christina Baselmans. She did all the programming, really pulled this, this, that together. The last time we were out here was three months ago in March. Um, not here, but for the all boards meeting. At that time, we, chose, we had multiple options here, and the school building committee and Permanent Building Committee chose three options to study further. And those were, we call them AR1, which was kind of a minimal addition renovation scheme, AR2, which was a much more substantial and invasive uh, addition renovation scheme, and then NC1, which was new construction on the same site. We are also studying base repair just as a comparison, just as a yardstick to gauge what would it cost to do, to do just basic repairs on this building to keep it going? And that, that base repair option would be non-reimbursable by MSBA. The town would have to bear the full uh, cost of that option because it does not meet the educational program. And that's, that's an important distinction. Um, we, we submitted the preliminary design program, the PDP following that meeting in the end of March. We received MSBA's comments, we responded to them, um, and we continued to uh, refine and develop the floor plans and site plans that, that you see tonight. Um, we, in, in mid-May, we, uh, we sent our documents to the cost estimators. We had, Lamarro Pagano has our own cost estimator, and your OPM has, has a separate cost estimator. And they worked independently um, with the same documents to put together costs for all of these, um, which we'll speak to a little bit later. Um, we also had some program revisions as we started to see some of those costs come back and um, some of the comments from MSBA. And we realized that the MSBA might not be reimbursing for certain Certain things that were in the program, we made some cost uh, adjustments or program revisions that will ultimately affect cost, and Peter will speak to those a little bit later in more detail. We, we also, in response to some of the MSBA's comments, we uh, developed a new option, one that you hadn't seen before, and it was, it's kind of a hybrid option, somewhere in between the minimalist AR1 option and that more invasive AR2, and it kind of uh, combine some of the best attributes of, of each one and in a much more cost-efficient package, we believe. We've also, uh, just to update you on our, our progress, we've had the site surveyor has been out there. They're producing the site survey. We've met with police and fire. Um, and that's, that's what we've been doing. So for tonight's agenda, um, we'll give you a little recap of the options again. Um, We'll show you the AR 1.5, which you may not have seen. Uh, we'll show you the updated site and floor plans. We have updated our 
ranking matrix so that all, the, uh, all of the options that are still in the mix have new ratings, similar to the approach we used last time, but you'll be able to see just how those stack up against each other. And we also have estimated range of costs. And with that, I will turn things over to Peter Caruso and let him take that over. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to review uh, the base repair option, the Ad Reno AR1, and the Ad Reno AR2 options. And Sean gets the pleasure of showing you the new AR1.5 option as well as the new construction NC1 option. So up here, uh, just as a recap from the last time we met three months ago, the base repair option, as um, Steve mentioned earlier, if this option is selected, MSBA would not support it at, under the base repair option. You will have effectively leave the MSBA program and 100% of the cost would be on the town to bear. This option does not address deficiencies such as walking through one classroom to get to another. Uh, no new modifications, no new spaces are being proposed under this option. You will get new equipment, you will also get new finishes, but no new spaces. Also, in addition to any code upgrades, equipment will be replaced under this option, as I mentioned. Now, the equipment that's here is at, near, or beyond its useful life. I know if you walk down the corridor, any one of these corridors, you can look around and say, uh, Peter, I don't know what you're talking about. This building looks great. And that's true. It's a testament to how well the building has been maintained. But if you dig down deeper and look closely at all the other items that you don't normally pay attention to, you'll see that there are a lot of deficiencies that need to be uh, repaired or addressed. For instance, the boilers in this building are 47 years old, well past their useful lifespan. The parts are becoming more difficult to, to obtain, to do maintenance to the, um, to the equipment. Also, uh, this option would certainly require the use of temporary modular classrooms. That is one uh, construction line item that MSBA would also not support under any of the options at all. So what you see up on the screen is the floor plans of the existing school. I showed you this slide three months ago back in March where all the spaces in red are greater than 10% below MSBA guidelines. Most notably, the classrooms, all the, that, that Sean's highlighting right now. All the spaces in blue are greater than 10% above MSBA guidelines, most notably the gymnasium and the cafeteria that we're in right now. And lastly, all the remaining spaces in gray, which there's not too many of them, are within 10% of MSBA's guidelines. So what you see up on the screen is the first of several options comparisons that you're going to see throughout the presentation. And starting off with the base repair, this is the same ranking system that was used three months ago. We updated it for the PSR, for this next phase that we're in right now. And just as a recap, the ranking was one through five, where one was least favorable and five was most favorable. Now under the base repair option, most notably, obviously the educational program fulfillment, this building will not support your education program. It's the least favorable. That also leads to the space summary variations. It's the least favorable in comparison to that as well. And pointing out lastly, the estimated local share, the bottom line item, that's because it would, the cost for this option would be 100% borne by the town. Excuse me, sir. Is this option required or was it requested? We're required with MSBA to continue pursuing this. Thank now, ultimately, at the end of this phase, we're in the PSR phase right now, the preliminary uh, preferred schematic report. At the end of this, the town will have selected one option to proceed forward with to the next phase. You've also seen this slide previously. This is another recap. What you see up on the screen, I know you can't read it, but these are what's called space summary templates, the MSBA guidelines that actually, those are for this project that lists every single space being existing and being proposed. 
Now, under these guidelines, for a 550 students grades 5 through 8 configuration, you're looking at 130,000 gross square feet. For a 700 students grades 4 through 8 configuration, you're looking at 150,000 square foot building. Now, since then, we received MSBA's comments on the PDP submission that we presented back on March 28th. It became clear to us after receiving their comments that MSBA is not going to fully support your educational program and all the spaces associated with that. So with recommendations from the district, we revisited this and we determined that based on the reduction in square footage for a 550 student grade configuration, we're looking at 119,500 square foot building down from the 133. For a 700 students grades fourth rate configuration, we're down 14,000 square feet to 136,000 from 150. This has its benefits, of course, it's smaller, it's less costly, but we're also able to take advantage of the building being more efficient. So starting off with the AR, yes? Just for a point of reference, what's the current square footage for this building? 130,000 130, square feet. Almost exactly. So starting off with uh, AR1 for 700 students, uh, the ad reno option. As you can see uh, from the site plan, the two main items I want to point out is Sean's highlighting them in uh, the orange color. At the northwest corner, we would be rebuilding uh, the admin, medical, and, and uh, guidance suite to better accommodate your educational program. And then on the east side of the building, that would be dedicated to the fourth grade classroom wing addition. And going with the next slide, you'll be able to notice the circulation, the orange and red are the emergency circulation as well as the parent drop off accommodating the uh, east uh, classroom wing addition, and then the bus drop off would be how it is right now uh, on the north side of the building. This is a 3D massing model which basically shows the relationship on the site to other features. Now this is a floor plan which we haven't seen. If you may recall, when we were here back in March, you saw very preliminary, very schematic like shaped bubble diagrams. Well, this is an actual working plan that we needed to bring, you know, refine and get to this for this next stage. So up on the top uh, right, uh, top, sorry, top left at the northwest corner, that is the admin guidance and medical suite edition. On the far east would be the fourth grade classroom wing edition. The other items I'd like to point out is that while uh, we are still maintaining those odd shaped classrooms on the north and south side of the building, we're now eliminating the classroom that you would have to walk through to get to the, to the other classroom and we're turning those into common spaces which there's one for each neighborhood, so it's where uh, multiple classrooms can come together. It's like a, a community space, a common space for all those uh, neighbor classroom neighborhoods. Uh, also, I'd like to point out that the gymnasium and the cafeteria we're standing in, those would not change. These would not, size-wise, they would not change. So that has an advantage because under the MSBA guidelines, those spaces would be smaller. As I showed you previously with the blue spaces that I, I called out attention to. The other item is that, uh, as Sean's pointed out and highlighted in yellow, you have two existing exterior light wells, one on either side of the media center. We're going to capture those spaces. We're going to cover them with a skylight and we're going to use those as interior spaces. On the first floor, they would become corridors. And then up on the second floor, they would be open to below, thus allowing sunlight to come down to the interior spaces. Uh, another item I want to point out is that we, just like the base repair, we would reskin the entire building to allow it to be more energy efficient. Also, uh, just in terms of the grade configuration, on the first floor you'd have grades four, five, and six, and on the second floor you would have grades seven and eight. So you'd have that separation for the for the upper grades. 
And getting into the 550 option, really, it's a recap. The only difference is we just would not build the fourth grade wing on the east side. So the fifth and sixth grade would still be on the first floor, and the seventh and eighth would be on the, on the second floor. So options comparisons for AR1. When you compare it to the base repair, we are much better. Uh, the estimated local share you see is very high. That's because it has the highest uh, reimbursement rate from, from MSBA. The educational program, you'd see that it fares a little bit better, fairly in the, in the middle of the, of the range. Space summary uh, template variations, again, we're in the middle of the range where it does and it doesn't meet all of, the, all of the space requirements. And then site and facility goals and objectives and energy efficiency and utilities, we fare pretty good in, 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 that, in those categories. So for AR2, this one has a lot of renovation work associated with it. You'll notice in, in orange you have the northwest classroom wing as well as the southeast classroom wing additions that we're proposing. But most notably, we are completely gutting the center portion of the school and turning that into a large courtyard to allow sunlight to get into those interior spaces. Most notably, along that wall. You'd be able to get sunlight into here. Sean, if you could just highlight where Sean's highlighting the uh, wall, this wall right here. Also, in terms of circulation around the site, uh, we're able to accommodate that easily, the classroom wing. But one item I'd really like to point out to you is, as I mentioned, under AR1, it would require the use of temporary modular classrooms. In this option, it would not, which would save some money, because regardless of which option, temporary modular classrooms are 100% borne by the town, the responsibility of the town to pay for. In this case, we would propose to build the classroom wings first, and we could use those spaces as swing space. So we would not need the temporary classroom wing, uh, temporary classroom uh, modulars. And this is just showing a 3D massing model and showing the relationship to the site features. Getting into the floor plans, you will now see closer. You did not see these before. They were very preliminary bubble diagrams. Now we have an actual working floor plan to discuss, to show you. We have the seventh and eighth grade classroom wing on the northwest side. We did that because it's closer to the existing high school. And then the fourth and fifth grade on the southeast corner of the building. Essentially, up on the second floor, we'd have the fifth grade. The sixth grade would be in the center section of the building. And again, seventh and eighth uh, shared spaces on the northwest. Also, we have the admin guidance and medical uh, suite that we would remove from where it is and we will put it front and center of the building on the north side. Very prominent location. The two main entrances would remain. And then on the south side of the building, we have the media center. Along that, while the classrooms would be removed because we'd have the new classroom wings we're adding. And then another item I'd like to call your attention to is that the gymnasium and the cafeteria uh, cafetorium under this plan would remain, again, they're larger than what MSBA would allow. So it has its advantages. Uh, and then up on the second floor, as I mentioned, uh, is the sixth grade in the center of the building, and then fifth and um, seventh and eighth shared spaces in the classroom wings. Going to the 550 option, it's a simple, uh, simple way to address the fifth grade wing would just become a single story instead of a two story. And under this option as well, the entire building would be reskinned to add insulation to it to allow the building to be more energy efficient. And then getting to the options comparison, uh, you know, compared to AR1, we fare a little bit better with the educational program fulfillment, but this, this option has the most square footage and it ends up being uh, the most, most costly, as you can see, well, short of the base repair, it's the most costly option to the, to the town. And in terms of site facilities, goals and objectives, we fare 
This option fares pretty well. The construction phasing impact, it's better than AR1 because we have the swing space we can use with the new classroom wings, not necessarily needing uh, temporarily modular classrooms. And the space summary of variations, uh, it does not fare that well as in comparison to MSBA guidelines. So I will hand it over to Sean who will talk, he, he gets all the fun ones to talk about. Good evening, how are you doing tonight? Um, so as we mentioned, uh, we really wanted to kind of create the best of both worlds. Uh, you saw AR1, you saw AR2, the invasiveness, the disruption to students and staff. We wanted to try to minimize that as much as possible. And I'm gonna kind of characterize the best traits that we took. Uh, in this view so you can start to take it in. Uh, so rather than blowing a large hole in the middle of the building, we decided to take that same scheme of capturing those light wells with a skylight. So we'll maintain those light wells, but rather than them being bricked in like they are now, we'd remove all those brick walls and really open them up with a lot of glass to bring light, natural light, really a lot of indirect light if we use the right type of skylight material down into these classrooms. Because we don't want any of these classrooms, any students that are in a space all day, never mind all year, to not have some access to daylight, never mind fresh air. Uh, the other thing that we did was we know there's some severe deficiencies around your science lab spaces, which are right in the middle of your building. And due to the size of them and the, the tech heavy exhaust, all the other features they need, we really want to move those into the new addition. So in this particular option, we have the seventh and eighth in this particular wing. Now I'm sure those of you that are really following along, you might ask, why isn't the seventh and eighth wing on the front of the building? Well, part of the reason we didn't do it on the front of the building, even though it would get us closer to the high school, had a lot to do with cost. We're always trying to think about how's the contractor gonna stage this site? How are they gonna access the site? And what does that mean for the overall disruption to your staff and students? Well, by putting it on the back here, it really allows us to allow the contractor to have a nice lay down area in the back here. And really keeps that construction in that early phase separate from the rest of the building. So in this particular option, we're not taking out that front northwest corner as you saw in all the previous options. So the major construction to, in order to construct our swing space is all relegated back to this rear area here. So early on, that's where all the action will happen. So now I'm gonna go through the same se sequence of slides you saw so you can really start to take in what this option looks like. Uh, site circulation would be very similar to the others get some additional queuing on site to really get a lot of parents and everything off of uh, 110, which is highly desirable. This is what it would look like overall massing for the facility. And here's what that uh, floor plan looks like. So I'll walk you through the building. Rather than taking over this existing uh, admin area, we would convert this to the art classrooms. Um, the great part about this structure is almost all the structure has a lot of great clear spans from exterior wall to the corridor wall. So the, in order to really achieve all these, we'll be removing all those interior partitions. The other thing that is also the same as all the other options you saw, we'd be completely recladding the building here. Some of you might ask, what does that mean? That really means it could still look like brick. We could go back with metal panels. Really, we can re-envision this building. Um, we felt very strongly, not only because it was difficult to navigate through those classrooms to those we were endearingly calling them barnacles on the front and the back of the building. Um, we really thought it was a great opportunity to kind of take those back because they were really preventing a lot of daylighting to the other classrooms. And they were also restricting the overall size of the classrooms. But here, after we remove those, we're able to get your admin, nurses suite, medical suite right into the middle part of the building. This would allow us the opportunity to create a really nice entry, a kind of sense of welcoming, uh, a, a place to have uh, visions and presence on Route 110. A lot of the features would start to kind of remain the same, but just we really maximize the space. Your Vogue Tech Labs would end up here, cafeteria, uh, gymnasium would remain the same. Media center for a lot of intensive purposes would remain the same. I'm gonna just jump to the upper floor real quick. However, we would create that media center to have a two-story volume. Because we have a big building, 
and we need to take pieces out of the building in order to add to the rear side. Otherwise, we're going to end up in that same situation as AR2, where we had a building that was pushing 160,000 square feet. As you can see, we're, we're much lower. We're right in between AR1 and AR2 at 150,000. We're able to achieve some of that reductions by punching holes and, and bringing in a two-story lobby. Um, the other great thing is, is by removing all these walls, we get uh, the right size classrooms. A lot of your classrooms are undersized. Nice new wing for seventh and eighth. Should this be the desired solution going forward? Going back to that question again, could we put it off the front of the building? Absolutely, we could. But there is other construction impacts there on circulation as construction is ongoing. Um, you're starting to see those light wells here. It becomes a little less important about uh, these light wells because some of the classrooms off of it, there aren't nearly as many as there was in um, AR1 and AR2. The orientation uh, for uh, classroom configuration, fourth grade would be down here, seventh and eighth stacked in the new wing, and fifth and sixth in this upper area. This, once again, great opportunity to get a lot of light in this middle of this building. You know, you have such a dense building here. And to be able to have those smaller interventions to really open them up and allow you to experience in them directly off of the corridors, we find to be a really fantastic opportunity. Um, there actually is precedent for this. Um, Methuen High School, if you want to open up your phone, Google it a little bit. It was an MSBA project. Uh, they took an open classroom building um, and punched a lot of holes in it above corridors to get light into those classrooms. It was really a poor decision we made in the mid-70s or, or late-60s to do a lot of these open uh, classroom opportunities. So when we try to go to 550, it becomes a little more invasive because, once again, we're adding all this square footage. How do I reduce the number of grades? So in the previous one, we had one grade, two grades stacked, and then two grades up above. Well, what we're going to do is delete the fifth grade. So as you watch in the next one, this now will become a one-story addition. So we'd actually rip off the whole front of the building, build a new one-story addition within the red lines that will match the height of the, the wings on either side. So fifth grade, seventh and eighth stacked, and then moving up sixth grade up here on its own. This starts to become a lot more inefficient. As you can see, we have a corridor over here that kind of leads to nowhere. I mean, we don't have the space. These are some of the, the difficult parts of working within an existing building. So to compare this to the other ones, um, as you can start to see, it's really starting to land, as we expected in a lot of respects, right between AR1 and AR2. Um, Space summary variations, a lot of it is more due to how much it ended up being over the square footage was what drove that number down. All your spaces, um, a matter of point in all of these from AR1 over, all your classrooms are going to be the right size space. All your science labs are going to be the right size space. What the deficiencies you're seeing and why they're ranking poorly is either they're not adjacent to the right space or they, they don't have access to daylight or they're simply you know, just not configured in the manner that would support a nice division between the higher grade levels and the lower grade levels to provide a little more color on the rankings that you're seeing here. Uh, it fares very well as far as site and energy efficiencies. Construction impact ends up being right in the middle um, as far as that goes. And then as you start to see, this really worked out really well. Uh, one thing I don't think was really mentioned, if you go with an uh, addition renovation option, you do get additional reimbursement points from the state by doing that. So that's where all of these started, uh, particularly AR1 started to fare quite well in the local share, but why uh, AR1.5 started to really shine. So new construction, um, you may recall the last time we presented, uh, we were showing several options. We looked at building next to the high school. We looked at building in front of the existing middle school. And ultimately, it was decided that building in this 
uh, southwest east corner uh, really would be the most desirable. And we wanted to keep that building as close to the existing building as possible to ensure it still had a presence on Route 110. Because we don't want to lose that. That's, you know, these educational institutions for any municipality, they're really a beacon. You know, there's something to look forward to. They're often community assets. Uh, wayfinding often becomes very difficult if they're set back. Fortunately, you don't have really an uh, overly mature site. It will still have great presence after that existing building is taken down. So here, simply put, a contractor could have great access off of South Main, could really fence this off easily, still allow for parents and emergency access around that existing building while construction is going on, open the new building, tear down the old building, and then you'll open for a year while that building is being torn down, and then you'll finish out your site features. So those of you might be asking, where are we going to park when that's happening? You'll still maintain your existing parking lot up here while this building is being demoed, and then in that final summer, you'll finish out the paving and other site features to be open for that following fall. Uh, this allows a tremendous amount of queuing, not only for buses, but also for cars. Uh, you really w should never see any backup on 110 in this particular option. You, you, special events, anything, you name it. Uh, you could even use a ring road for additional parallel parking should you have a big town meeting or, or a special event or something going on over at uh, the Veteran Athletic Complex. Here is a massing of what that building would look like on site. Uh, have some great opportunities. Um, one thing I, I should mention and go back, as you can see, the biggest impact on the site here is the loss of fields. Uh, we don't want to shy away with that in this option. We do, we are left over with a nice green space out front, but due to its proximity to parking and other roads, uh, it's really not desirable to reproduce any of the softball fields or baseball diamonds in that area. A baseball diamond wouldn't quite fit. Uh, so we're currently showing a recreation field. You'd be able to replicate those basketball courts. We'd end up getting an age appropriate playground like we did in all the other options. And here we'd have a nice courtyard with some outdoor learning spaces for you all. Uh, here's the floor plan. So here uh, we really felt, you know, I talked to, provided a little color on the configuration of the building. So um, meeting your educational delivery model, we were trying to balance a lot of things. Uh, we have quite a range of age groups that would potentially be coming to this building, four through eight. Uh, how do we ensure those students are known by teachers, feel comfortable, have a sense of ownership, and I don't know, you, I've, I've been through this building many times, I get turned around all the time. I, there's not many views to the exterior. So that's one thing that we also tried to do here. If you see a lot of our corridors and, and views through spaces, often will provide a glimpse or a view so you can orient yourself. Those are the things we really tried to achieve here. And additionally, that we really tried to achieve that I didn't point out is in all the other options, your gym and your cafeteria were right in the middle of your building, which never really allowed you a meaningful way to lock them off for after hour use. As you can see here, we have a nice divide between academic wings and that shared core common community space, so we can lock that off. We have a really nice uh, lobby that unifies all this, looks right out through the media center within this courtyard, which would then look out to that outdoor learning space. You have your admin me medical guidance here. Great opportunities for should there ever be a, an emergency or an ambulance has to come, we have that discretion off of this corridor. It's also really close to the gymnasium where often uh, you know injuries or other things can happen. Uh, with that, we have kind of OTPT, wellness classrooms, all clustered here with the PE program, cafeteria, stage with the band room and course spaces in the back. The stage will have a, a really high acoustically ceiling wall to act as an additional classroom space. And then you get into the academic wings. Here we have seventh and eighth stacked on top of each other. Fourth, fifth, and then six comes up over here. And then the other nice thing here is our service yard. Those of you that know, your service yard has quite a prominent role here. You can see it quite a bit from 110 and even as you're approaching the building. Here we have your service yard and your kitchen and everything else tucked around more on the reservoir side, uh, which was another great option here in that respect. 
So this is how the sixth grade would come out and around and wrap around that gymnasium. So we have some great opportunities to look into the gymnasium from those corridors above. Uh, so you have special events, rallies, just even just wayfinding, right? We can have a nice clear story with that volume coming up, maybe some skylights in there also. Another way to introduce some light that this, this current building really suffers from not having. Seventh and eighth. Art classrooms, really some great orientation here, uh, overlooking some exterior spaces. We'll have some really nice light. And then the fifth grade with their common room. Uh, the way we would get down to the 550 is we simply wouldn't build the sixth grade. So what that means is this will read as kind of a one story. We'll still have the larger two story cafeteria and lobby volumes. And then you'll just have the two academic wings above. I know I did that one quickly, but so five, six stacked. 7, 8 stacked is how we get to the 550. So as you can imagine, the rankings, I think I touched upon them. I, w I won't belabor them here. There's a lot of benefits uh, to going to freeing ourselves of the existing uh, parameters and restrictions of an of a ad reno option. Uh, you'll see the cost. The one I will point out where it doesn't fare uh, the best is uh, while we have a really efficient building, you're not getting those additional reimbursement points. Um, but that doesn't really tell the whole picture. This is just a ranking. This doesn't actually tell you the actual numbers. Um, and additionally, you may be aware your school committee uh, previously made the recommendation to proceed with the 700 option. What you may not be aware of is MSBA made it a requirement of our group to carry the 550 option until this stage, till you guys make your final selection to go into schematic design. So with that being said, to try to, it's a busy map that was up there, so kind of want to dumb it down a little bit for lack of a better term. So this is really the rankings for the 700s when you start to see how it shakes out. And for those of you that are quick with math, you might already be there, but this is how, this is how the options rank when you take them based off of the numbering system and weighted uh, options that we did. So new construction would come in first, AR2 second, AR1 third, AR, sorry, 1.5, AR2 fourth, and then base repair and last. As I mentioned, cost, is is really could change your opinion on these and with that being said i'm going to let trip be the one that uh introduces this for you uh i will say all this we we work diligently with everyone the their trip will talk about the rising cost of construction and everything i won't steal his thunder too much and uh we'll circle back to this and we're going to show you the overall construction timeline and the cost impact back on this chart after trip talks a little bit more yeah, go ahead. Which of the options is the most secure? The most secure? Uh, I would definitely say it's the new construction, absolutely. Um, part of the reason why is, uh, I, I can go back and talk about it. a lot of it is, the way we design around security nowadays, it starts with the site, right? You first, you have the, as far as car approaches, parking lot orientations, how close in proximity you can bring vehicles within the building, we start there. Uh, we really ensure that we ensure student safety, emergency access, redundancies. Uh, when I go back to, I'm going to go back to the floor plan because I think this is a great question to, to spend a little time and talk about. You'll see here we're actually showing a, a, an emergency access road. And, and we're very conscious that those that live over the Rock Ave here off of South Main Street, that the last thing they'd want is to have any parents or kids zipping through there. That's not what we want here. But what we really want is to have that redundancy. Should something be occurring at the front of this building that prevents access, from these two access roads for all intents and purposes that kind of converge at the front, it would really restrict emergency access, God forbid anything did happen. So that would be one of the first things we do and one of the great opportunities we have the year. In addition to that, we also use measures, we then start to think of where are our main entry points. Your existing building has way more entry points than we would ever want to put in a new building. You have that donut of circulation. You have the pinwheel of, I'll actually go back and point, point, point it out to you on these floor plans. So here you have these corridors. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, we're already up to 10 access points to the building. Every single one of those access points is a vulnerability. Um, and what we try to do when we reduce it in a new school option is we use what uh, we call like a double buzzer 
uh, approach. So we actually will have what is called like an A phone. It's a video audio visual phone. You'll have to buzz in to get into the vestibule and then you're locked. You're not like locked from leaving the vestibule, but you're locked in the vestibule from getting into the lobby. And what that means is then you have to then do a secondary buzzer that would let you into the admin area. So your admin is always your first line of defense. Um, and so this, not only are we providing protection to the school with the first buzzer, but we're allowing that administrator to have that second tier of protection for themselves, but to actually visualize them. Now they might not have saw them fully. You know, you're seeing them on a camera. Now they can see them, you know, the full head to toe. Um, we have used, uh, you know, as far as trying to outfit existing windows and everything with bullet resistant glass or bulletproof glass, we have done that. Uh, it's come a long way. And then after that, the security advantages to try to lock down a building like this uh, are a lot easier. Um, we actually had a great conversation with uh, the police, fire, uh, and the building inspector around um, with Parkland and others, they did pull the fire alarm. We do have the ability to work closely with AHJs and, and the school department to have overrides. Should someone actually do that to get all the doors to be open, you can override it and have lockdowns. So outfitting that in a new building, we can have strategic doors at main corridors that we can activate those overrides on and compartmentalize the building should there ever be an active shooter or in any, any other type of intruder. To try to put that into an existing building that has as many corridors as there is and there's donut circulation and connecting classrooms, it becomes ever more costly. And it's just truly difficult just due to simply to the setup. And then lastly, after that, what we really do after that is we, it's really your policies and procedures, because ultimately it's your teachers being aware. Um, that's really your front line. You know, I talked about for us, because we're coming from the design side, starting at the site. But strategically, honestly, it's really your teachers, your guidance counselors, your administration are really the ones that are keeping the closest eye on this. And we, we set up a building where you have eyes on the street. Here, you don't have eyes on the street. Almost every classroom really turns its back on the corridors. You have those large bathrooms and, and storage spaces between your classrooms. Students could be milling about in those corridors and donuts and around, and you'd have no clue that they were there. Now, you might think that feels more secure because the classrooms are removed from it, but if there's something going on, you, you, you have no way, and then never mind for police or fire, to try to clear a building like that, it becomes all that more difficult. So, I, I hope I answered a lot. I don't, I don't want to fear monger or anything, but these are the things we, we are always thinking of when we design this for you. Do you have cameras throughout the building? Yep, we'd have cameras throughout the building, uh, interior, exterior. Um, that's all included in the price, strategically located. Uh, you know, bathrooms are always notorious. We wouldn't have them in the bathrooms, but we'd have them on the, the entries in the corridors so you can always find out who's coming or going, if there's ever vandalism or to that nature. Um, yep, absolutely. Uh, the other thing we do, uh, for those that are really curious about it, call assurance buttons are another thing that we included in the cost. Uh, what this is, is it's actually like a silent alarm in the classrooms. We usually have one strategically located in this zone that's deemed for the shelter in place area. Uh, we do know you guys practice ALICE, which is an acronym for a particular response to uh, an active shooter. And in that secure shelter zone, we'd have a, a, a button that a teacher could hit. It opens in a direct line to the main office to let them know. And when it comes into the main office, they know that that's what it's coming in over. So they could just continue to talk as if nothing's going on, not to alert anyone in the classroom that it's happened. But we also have another button near the classroom phone that allows the teacher to do the same thing. We also can have a relay that if the main office doesn't answer it, it can dispatch directly to police or fire, and they'll pick up the phone. So there'll always be somebody who picks up the phone when that button is pressed. Is there anything available in the market that you didn't include because of cost? Uh, we didn't carry, I will say we didn't carry the cost of uh, like bulletproof glass. I, it, that's a conversation as we go forward. There's other efficiencies. Uh, I can't say we didn't include it because some of our costs now carry quite a bit of design contingency, escalation, other things. So we may be able to buy them at the price range we're showing or maybe even on the higher range of the price range you're going to see. So it would be kind of a misnomer to say we're not carrying anything. Um, 
but it's not something we, we typically, like all the other features I mentioned, include because of the premium. It, it really can become cost prohibitive quite quickly. All right, I will let Trip get to the money. Uh, I didn't think my turn was coming up. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a good question. A excellent question. Um, yeah, we're going to move out of the design stuff. That's not my forte. Oh, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so I, I get the maybe the unenviable place to talk about the cost. And we've just gone through a process working with two independent estimators that we've then compared back to one another, and it's called leveling out, so that we have a good sense of what is the cost in the market. Before I go into the estimated numbers for each of these options, let's take a quick look at what is the market and what has happened. We're looking at a school project, so there's no better place than to look at resident data that's with the MSBA. These are actual figures or, or uh, markings on a cost chart that represent roughly 13 years of projects as they've occurred with the MSBA as they funded them. In the last four years, we've seen a very, very steep increase in the market. And we've all heard about it, we've all felt it in our pocketbooks and seen it at the grocery store. The market has increased incredibly high it, as, as the trend line showing construction that was once in the uh, 500, 450 range four years ago is now progressing to year 2025 to close to $800 a square foot for school construction. So this is taking all the other types of construction out. This is an incredible um, rise in cost. Costs, as you can see, don't tend to go down. They tend to increase over time. So this is this is a time and place where we're experiencing some very heavy market conditions as far as costs are concerned. A recent project that just went through the MSBA, which is about eight months in front of you, which is the Whitman Han Hansen Middle School, I chose that as an example. And their construction costs right now, and again, they're about eight months in front of you, is about $742 a square foot for construction. So like it or not, this is a, um, this is a trend, this is the world we're living in, and it, it doesn't look like it's going the other way. The trend data would say it never goes the other way. Um, when, I'm, when I'm looking at this, I just want to clarify, we're going to talk about construction costs and soft costs. Those, those combined equal the project cost. So as, as I might say, construction cost, that's not the project cost. It's, it's a combination of construction plus soft cost. Next slide. If we look at the base repair, and you saw on the earlier slides that it was um, one of the most costly as far as, and least desirable as, as far as local share is concerned. The reason is that you don't have any MSBA funding, but it's also that the building is old and certain things have been put off in anticipation of this project coming. And that becomes somewhat important because the uh, building code in Massachusetts says once you get, once you improve a structure to the tune of 30% of that structure's value, you then trigger code compliance as part of the project. So what does that mean? You don't have sprinklers in this building. If we were to spend 30% of this building's value, and this building's value is roughly around $14 million, so let's just say it's like if you spend $3.5 million or so, you now trigger code events, you'd have to meet ADA compliance with all door hardware, with all uh, bathroom fixtures, um, with, with all ramps and sloping. You would have to uh, do a full fire su suppression system in this building. If you were to just deal with your HVAC system and the roof that was temporarily repaired a few years ago, you've now triggered a whole slew of other things. Those, those, those other things come with those marginal repairs. So not that I can say I have the crystal ball to tell you what it might cost, but I would tell you that you quickly and most definitely are going to trigger your code compliant requirement the minute you touch the boilers and the minute you touch your roof, and both of which need to happen. So 
you know, you could find yourself in a year or two, whenever that might happen, all of a sudden funding $30 million or more just to bring this and, and continue to operate this building. And so we didn't spend a lot of time studying it, but we looked at if you were to bring this building back to a place where you could use it for another 50 years, your costs over five to 10 years, solely borne by the town, are likely to be north of a $100 million. And I don't know that it's 100 or 120, but it's somewhere in that neighborhood. You know, it, and, and it's just a reference point for you folks, is that the do nothing costs money. And the do nothing may cost you money in, in a larger sum sooner than what a, what a building project might be. It's possible. I don't know the, you know, without going through all of that process over years, that that would be the case. But, but this is a reference point for you. If we look at what we did, and there's so much information on this slide that I'm going to go to the next one in a sec. Because we said, because the MSBA said we have to look at the 550 and 700, we ran numbers on all of the options, whether they were 550 students or whether they were 700 students, as well as the base repair. What we, what we have done as a group and with you is really establish that the 700 enrollment makes the most sense for this community. So to focus on that, the, the, the first column base repair, as I said, it's somewhere north of $100 million, and that's zero contribution from the MSBA. Well, let's go to AR1. AR1, <clears throat> 700 students, has roughly 450, 400, and 45,500 students, excuse me, square feet. The MSBA has a cap on their square foot construction costs that they will participate in of $393. So let's go back to that market slide. If, if the market's saying that construction costs are $750 a square foot, the MSBA is only giving you grant funding up to $393. Does everybody sort of get that? So that means that they're leaving on the table somewhere at $350 um, dollars a square foot that goes back to the community. They just say, no, we cap that, regardless of what the cost is, but we cap it at $393. That's true for all of the options. So that's, that's something to realize. How come we're not getting more reimbursement? It's because the MSBA has a reimbursement cap. And it's intentionally set that way that you that projects are going to cost more than their cap. Next line down is uh, the cost estimators total project cost, including contingencies. So while the the project cost might come in, uh, say for the first one, AR1, at 137 to 151, we provided a range because we're not perfect at this limited design stage. But let's just say that was like 125 was the, the mid number. We then added certain amount of contingency so the community wouldn't have to bear the burden of, oops, we just went over by $5 million or whatever. So we have a contingency. If the contingency doesn't get spent, it doesn't get bonded, and the taxpayers don't pay for it. So it's, it's you know, if we save money along the way, it, the, the taxpayers just end up having a less of a burden. So with that AR1700, the reimbursement range was 58 to 65 million, and it would put a local range of 78 to 86 million dollars. The project would occur over a four-year period of time. So as, as kids going through four through eight, that grade would be living through a renovation their entire middle school career. And the disturbance would be very, very high for those students just because of the nature of the beast. Because it's a very heavily, mainly renovation project. The, the next one in blue is an ad reno. This is even bigger. You had less efficiency. It's 156,000 square feet. Again, the cap is there. The project cost somewhere in the mid 150s. Uh, the maximum reimbursement somewhere in the mid 60s. Local share somewhere around $90 million, a four-year project. And it still has a high impact on students. 
The AR1, which was really uh, developed because we saw these numbers, is there a better way? Is there, is there a more efficient way to do a renovation and save money? And, and I think that they, they really push themselves to try to find that great option. This comes in at 150,000 square feet. It's roughly around 140 million total project cost. Again, we're presenting it in a range. It's roughly in the, um, the low 60s as far as reimbursement. The local share is in the mid, mid to upper 70s, four years and it still does have a high impact because of the nature of the renovation. The all new comes in more efficient. Because they can take the efficiencies and plan them in and design it into the building, you're reducing your square footage. So they're coming in at 136,000 square feet, again the cap. Uh, the, the project cost is coming in in the low 140s, 140 million. The uh, maximum reimbursement is a little bit lower on new construction than it is on renovation. So you get additional re um, incentive points for a renovation. Therefore, the uh, new has a, a little bit lesser um, uh, MSBA grant funding. That comes in the mid-50s. The um, local share is in the mid 80s it's a three-year project and it would have very low impact on uh, the students and faculty as it was going through again if if uh, we're we're looking at this as a whole we want to go to the next slide you know you, you have you have these projects basically coming in at very similar numbers if you look at the overall scale of them and the, and the impact on the students and the community. You have benefits that are represented here by the color chart. Obviously green is good and red is bad. And, and you see you know, a very slight variation um, percentage-wise, so, you know, within 10, 12 percent of all the options. So with that, I think we're open to questions, unless you have any comments. We were going to share some of these slides, but I, yeah. like you, I just kept on going. Okay. I have a question. Um, how often does the um, MSBA look at their reimbursement and how? And the, the, uh, the, the market cap. So the market cap, the most recent one, I believe it was done in uh, December. Am I correct? Yeah, it was December. It went from 360 a square foot up to 393. Now, fingers crossed, we don't get to a place where we would be getting in front of them for approval for uh, about another year. So with the market in indications that I was showing, there is likelihood it goes up again. Fingers crossed. Nobody has that crystal ball. It is never a, a, a point in time. It's kind of like when they decide they need to. I have a feeling it may be a little politically motivated. So if yeah. they, if they um, agree, to, if they hire it, say, in 2024, and our project begins, and we finish by, say, 2028, are we getting that reimbursement locked in at the year that they approved our? Yes. So we're not, we wouldn't. No, so, but, but you don't get locked in with the MSBA for at least another year. It's when we get to the uh, board, and I think we were targeting a, a March or April board. May board. I think we're targeting a May board. I'll have to check that. Mid next year. Yeah, it, it's mid next year. So we have we have a period of time, and there are a lot of communities clamoring about that 393 number. It's across the state. I, I can just provide a little more color on that. So while MSBA is funded through the sales tax, they get you know one cent of the sales tax. Uh, their cap of funding every year is there's actually a cap. <laughs> I, I let that one out too soon. There's actually a cap. People don't realize so they have plenty of money in their coffers, but the legislation only allows them to use so much. Um, because of the rising cost of construction, they used to be able to fund like 13 to 17 projects a year. Based off of the cost data and the reason why they increased the percentage they did over this last year is they were projecting in their pipeline they're only going to be able to fund like 
eight to nine projects. So they're going to almost fund almost half of what they normally be able to do because of this. They actually have just passed the bill. They're going to allocate an additional $200 million. So they were at $800 million. Now they have $1 billion a year to work with. Sounds like a big number, but when you see these numbers here, you can see how it quickly shakes out to their percentage and share. Uh, that might buy them one or two high schools that they can participate in, maybe three or four extra elementary schools when you start to take into consideration the caps, that 393 cap, and they also have a cap on the site cost, was something we didn't talk about. They cap out at, is it 11? 10%. 10%. 10%. So they, they really kind of cut you off on, on all these different sides, and you don't know where it's going to shake out for you. Sure. So when you, when you mentioned the code compliance being triggered, when you were when you were to uh, spend up to thirty percent of the building's value, so what is the how does the state ensure that everything is brought up to code? What what can they? <laughs> yeah. but, but what so what would be the consequences or the ramifications if if the town doesn't provide funding? That's a good question. I couldn't answer for your building inspector. I. Um, Oh, thank you. I, I don't. I, I don't know that I want to be on the mic saying that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure your building inspector is an awesome guy, but uh, or person. Um, the building inspector, prior to you go, getting a building permit to do what you want to do, will say you've just triggered, and when that you just triggered, you haven't started any construction. Then it's well, no, you can't fix the boiler. You can't fix the roof. You know, you, you you're 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 being asked to do all these other things as well. The theoretically, the theoretically, I, I, I think the building inspector is probably a much better source than I am. Yeah, it, it, it's ultimately in the building code. It, to provide a little more color on that, it, if the question, I'm, I'm going to kind of put words maybe in your mouth. Sure. If the question is, if you do nothing, what are you required to do? You're actually required to do nothing. The, the code does not require you to do anything to this building. But what we were trying to articulate is, is you try to do even just the roof here, you're triggering AAB, you're going to trigger fire suppression. That's in the building code. Well, and that's what, that's what I'm referring to. So yeah. Say the point on the, the HVAC system, that's yep. obviously going to trigger it. Yep. So if the town was not to approve funding, for that, for the additional things that need to be uh, resolved to meet code, you can't do. You can't touch anything on this building. You'll we never be able to do deferred maintenance for the HVAC or anything. Yeah. Yep. Nothing. Yep. Yeah. So, so your your cost immediately just to replace your roof, you you have to tack on quite a considerable amount to do fire suppression in this building. And, and what we didn't really get into this when we go back to this base repair, and I could provide maybe a little more color on that, is um, that 30% threshold is for the AAB, which is the Mass Architectural Access Board. Uh, that has to do with stair risers, accessible toilets, you, know, you, you name it, signage. Now, that cost isn't overly significant, but there is now a threshold um, after really kind of that, that concert fire in Rhode Island around fire suppression systems and requiring assembly uses. When they do renovations, they have a threshold there also. That threshold would be passed very quickly, just like AAB would. So as you imagine, to put in a sprinkler system, you're taking down all your ceilings. Well, at that point, if you're taking down all your ceilings, are you going to put the same light fixtures back up in an existing ceiling? You're going to have them work around it. So it, then you start to kind of look at the disruption to students as far as deferred maintenance over time. So for us, if you're asking for our professional recommendation is if you wanted us to package something up that makes the most sense to phase into this building, you're going to want to do the roof. You're going to want to do fire protection. You want to do the electrical upgrades. You're going to want to do HVAC all at once because all these pieces and components go into that ceiling space. And some of you might say, well, why do we have to do the electric? Well, the new energy code, most likely you're going to be looking at all electric HVAC systems. That's the way it's going. So you're going to need to bring in a new electrical system, new branch work, new sub panels. Uh, all this stuff starts to really become a quick snowball effect. Uh, the code never really mandated these things as much as they are now in light of the energy code and other things. You used to be able to kind of 
do what you wanted, but now it's really being regulated. Once you touch this, there's so much more you get into. Well, and you're talking about cost on an asset that's worth $13 million. Exactly. So you just yep. spend quadruple that to maybe bring it up to where it needs to be. That doesn't yeah. Right yep. That doesn't meet the end program. Yeah. There was another question. Why wouldn't you want to bring it up to code anyway? Particularly the safety sprinkler system. If you're going to do any repairs, why would you do the sprinkler system? Even if it kicks it over the 30%. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yep. Yep. Oh, no, that's right. Um, I'll never get it back if I let you hold it. So, uh, yeah, we're so, so <clears throat> what it does is, or how it works, there's an extensive budget evaluation form that the MSBA has us fill out in order to get these numbers. In that form, there are all sorts of different calculations that take place on the number of square feet that they are going to allow. What they then do is say the number of square feet times that they will allow divided by your construction cost then gives them a square foot number. So they then take the square foot number of your construction cost that they will allow and they apply the 393 to it. On the other that they don't allow, they take that square footage and say that's just you. So I don't know whether I'm answering your question, Mike. So you're at 70 percent. So you're at 70. Yeah, 70 percent on reimbursable square footage, that then is subject to the cap. So the cap does come into. So it was never 70 percent. I'm sorry. It's 70 percent of eligible costs, yeah. right? So and it, no, it's so never never going to be. Yeah. It's probably more like something in the 40s. Yep. Yes. And and hopefully not high 30s, to be honest. Just well, they they, they also limit it uh, in certain ways with the um, consultants as well. So there, there's a, it's a it's a very complex form. Actually, it's it's very hard to sort of explain how it all works. And for many people, they never figure it out. It's it's like a funny Ouija board. There was a question in the back. That is correct. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. This is uh, this is statewide. It is to be non-discretionary to one town versus the other. You're correct. The percent changes on on need and various economic factors. Correct. Sure. So uh, this is a separate question. Sure. Uh, so I've, I've heard people mention that this building was originally constructed that there could be additions added to a third floor. I don't, I'm just like to fact check that and, and see if that was considered at any point. Uh, yeah, we, we did look at that. Our structural engineer looked at it and it is it doesn't have the capacity to meet current codes. The the structure the 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 roof structure cannot cannot support a, a floor floor current floor loads. I didn't hear. Could that be with with enough money, it could be. You could you you could throw an awful lot of money at, at that process. You'd have to open it up. You, you know, right now the the, the structure slopes to slopes to drains. You'd have to um, you'd have to create a flat flat structure that that. Uh, could support a floor. So, f theoretically, yes, you could, but uh, in in practice, it, it would be a, a you know an expensive and cost costly and and intrusive uh, process to actually implement that. Right. Right. If I could on this one, because I, I think it's 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 worth um, talking and in, 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 in providing a little more color on it. And 
So you may recall the target numbers for your larger enrollment, we got it down to 136,000 square feet. Um, your existing building is 130,000 square feet. So we only have a 6,000 square foot difference. Now you might say, well, why aren't we only putting a 6,000 square foot addition on this building and calling it a day? Well, there's a lot of reasons. First of all, your spaces are not large enough. So where we can afford to expand spaces to be the right size, they're not necessarily going to get us as many as we need in the locations that they need to be located at to support your educational program. Also, you know, we're not going to carve up this great asset that you have for your cafeteria to put two classrooms in the back or a maker space in the back of this. Same thing with your gymnasium, right? You have a really large gymnasium. How do we back into that existing 130? Well, I'll carve, a, you know, we could carve another 1,500 out of that square footage that you have in your gymnasium to become more efficient, but this is interior space. There has no access to light. So the way the space is allocated doesn't allow for a meaningful intervention in an ad reno to make those numbers work. And that's why AR2, we, we cut such a big chunk out of the middle when we added to the periphery. So as you saw, we took that really invasive one that thrust it out, we have to eat out of the middle, and then we, we try to pull it back. If we thrust out a little bit, what smaller pieces can we take out or just leave as circulation, which ultimately leads to an inefficient building? So because we're already at 130 and we're targeting 136, those other moves would be the way we do it, that adding is just going to exponentially increase the cost. Well, if there, are, if there are no other questions, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to present this information to you tonight. And I know that the uh, Permanent Building Committee and the School Building Committee appreciate um, you know, your attention and your focus on this, as it's such an important project for your community. And we say thank you. So just, just a couple of reminders. Um, so where we are in the process right now is we're trying to get the Permanent Building Committee and the, and the Building Committee uh, will meet, I believe a meeting next week, um, to try to basically look at this information and decide what is the one scenario that we want to move forward with. Um, at this point, it's not about funding that scenario, but it is, a, but obviously that's, that becomes a question. Uh, once we go, once we kind of go in that direction, um, it'll be developed over the, the next year or so, and it would be, we wouldn't be going for a vote for any type of commitment from the town until the target is next town meeting, so basically a year from now. Um, so that's sort of where we are in the process. At this stage, it's really trying to say, if these are our, our best four options, which one of these do we want to start to go with? And that's the building committee and permanent building committee will decide that uh, next week. So part of this was to give you some feedback so if you, or input, share things with you. So if anyone does have anything that they want to share, um, you can check the boards again over there. Talk to uh, members of the um, building committee if you need to. And also, if you have any questions about anything else, like some of those spaces when you showed, like the red spaces, if you haven't been through the building, um, we'll gladly show you some of the rooms in the front where you can see kind of the, the odd-shaped classrooms and the classroom that you have to walk through a classroom and all that kind of stuff. All right. Do we know when that meeting's going to be next week? Has that been? Tuesday at 6.30. It is a, yeah, it's a virtual meeting, and we post those, so it'll be on the town website. Yeah. So if you go to the project website, um, the all meetings are posted, and and the uh, login information will be on that posting. Yes. And this material is on that this material will be on the website. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Trevor. And if you want to sign in on your way out, thank you.